very pleased today. Great, so the recording has started. So for, for all, those of you who are wondering whether you'll receive a, a recording, you will indeed. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jill Alliston. And Jill is going to be speaking to us about older adults experiencing homeless, homelessness from her perspective as a geriatrician. She is a clinician, teacher, and assistant professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Toronto. She is a full-time faculty at St. Michael's Hospital, and she has a special clinical interest in caring for vulnerable older adults. Among many things, she is currently developing an outreach program to provide geriatric medicine consultation for older, older adults experiencing homelessness. And she's now going to share more about her work and her insights. So over to you, Dr. Alliston. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Let me just get my screen uh, shared and then get the slides up. So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, everything look okay? The slides are up? Looks great. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you so much for having me um, talk to you this afternoon. Um, just in terms of my disclosures, I just want to highlight that I, I am not an expert. I'm very, um, I, I'm a novice in, in this field, but I have learned a lot from the patients that I've worked with over the past year. I have no um, disclosures um, in terms of any relationships with commercial entities, um, conflicts within this presentation, um, or bias. I wanted to highlight that all of the cases are uh, fictionalized to protect identity of the patients uh, that I've worked with, but they've all been um, based upon experience. Um, uh, cases that uh, I have seen or representative of um, patients that I, uh, that I have uh, seen. So at the end of this webinar, I hope that you will be able to understand the state of homelessness in older adults in Canada, uh, describe the concept of accelerated aging in those who are homeless, identify geriatric syndromes in older adults experiencing homelessness, and create care plans for older adults who are at risk of or who are homeless. So just to give you an outline, I'll first talk a bit about um, older adults experiencing homelessness in Toronto and Canada, uh, talk about geriatric syndromes in this group, discuss a bit about their healthcare usage and outcomes, and then some strategies for caring for older adults who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And just to highlight, we will be interacting through some cases. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background in terms of what I have been doing clinically, so there have been um, some, some, some delays obviously due to COVID-19 uh, in terms of setting up a, a shelter outreach program, but uh, during uh, COVID-19 I have been able to establish a weekly clinic at Scarborough Village Residence. And to say that I'm doing shelter work I think is an exaggeration because Scarborough Village Residence is really a special um, a very special place um, and it's not a traditional shelter. So it's sort of identified that there are um, extra needs of older homeless individuals and it's actually a place that provides um, a uh, case managers um, or, or counselors, uh, client support workers, there's nursing care on site, um, it's accessible, um, there's availability of Lynn to come in, um, family practice within the building, um, and it's a transitional shelter where there's usually a, you know, all clients sort of have a care plan of where they will transition to after the program, often to um, housing, uh, but also um, things like long-term care, etc. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about um, some cases that are loosely based on the uh, experiences that I've had doing this clinic. And I wanted to start off with a case, um, you know, similar to the one of the first cases that I saw while starting up this uh, clinic um, that really... Um, uh, brought along a lot of reflection for me and in, in, um, doing uh, and starting up this program. So uh, this is a 70 year old man and I was asked to see him from the family physicians who work at the uh, shelter for falls and cognition. There's a past history of alcohol use disorder, but currently abstinent uh, diagnosis that sort of um, 
cropped onto his or popped onto his past medical history of Parkinsonism, NYD, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, and a past stroke. Uh, he's on quetiapine, rivaroxaban, metformin, glycoside, atorvastatin, bisoprolol. And in terms of uh, from sort of the, the chart in terms of his shelter use, he's been in the shelter since 2015 after selling his house with, under unclear circumstances. And on sifting through notes on connecting Ontario, you note that he's been in multiple uh, shelters since, some rental properties um, from some of the Lynn notes, there has been issues with him paying rent. His income is CPP and OAS and there's no involved family. And this 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 uh, client was recently transferred to Scarborough Village residence, and prior to his admission there, there had been over 12 ED visits over six months for hospital admissions in the last year. Um, reasons including hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state is not taking glycoside and metformin, numerous falls, and during one of the stays was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease or vascular Parkinson's and missed follow up with neurology, delirium, a stroke. Um, not taking rivaroxaban previously prescribed for his atrial fibrillation um, and social reasons. So presenting to the emergency department asking for housing help um, or shelters sending him to the ED because they cannot manage his medical needs. When I see him, he's a very vague historian. He can't um, give me a complete history of how he sort of landed within the shelter system, vague history around his health needs. Uh, speaking with staff, there's poor reasoning skills. Uh, um, he's occasionally agitated because he's inflexible and cannot hear other people's perspectives. But so he is able to learn the new area of the city that he's in and take a bus um, on a fixed route to one of the stores nearby, has a cell phone, and he'll go to the nursing station for his medications. On his review of systems, he has recurrent falls, typically occurring with transferring, um, urinary incontinence, which seems a combination of functional and urge, constipation, and low mood. And since being at Scarborough Village, which as I mentioned, is a very supportive shelter, he's been able to be assessed by Lynn Occupational Therapy and, and his counselor. He's been hooked up with a walker. They filled the forms to get him a motorized wheelchair. Um, he goes to the nursing station for his medications. We see significant improvement in his hemoglobin A1C. Uh, they've started managing medical appointments and they've been able to reestablish neurology follow-up. And remarkably, over the one year that he is is now there, there have been no emergency department visits. So as I mentioned, this um, similar case brought up a lot of reflections for me, and I learned a lot just from going through the chart review. And I'm just opening it up to the chat uh, if you want to sort of post comments about what can we learn from this case? Um, what emotions does this case bring out for you? And you can just put them directly in the chat box. Yeah, so I see the need for right supports for older adults with specific medical needs and social supports. So really, really great point. We see that there's a lot of medical needs that were not being um, addressed. Um, import, proper supports are important for stability. How can we intervene earlier? Missed opportunities. So um, uh, really great points and a lot of the reflections that I took. And um, from sort of the early cases that um, I was seeing at Scarborough Village, it sort of brings up the synopsis or what I hope that you'll sort of get from the talk today. So remembering that our traditional shelters are not designed with older complex patients in mind and that there can be stabilization that we see within that stable environment and providing those supports as, um, as Hazel pointed out. Um, geriatric syndromes are highly prevalent um, and, you know, they were not identified or not addressed. So as um, uh, Dr. Liu had pointed out, um, that there, was, there were missed opportunities um, and the importance of sort of community care and where we could have in intervened earlier. Um, and then also highlights the stigmatization of homeless older adults. So um, as pointed out, there were missed opportunities. And I had to sort of stop and, and wonder, 
were some of those missed opportunities because there was stigmatization of this um, patient being a, a shelter user. Um, so this sort of forays into the outline and talking a little bit about older adults um, experiencing homelessness um, in Toronto and Canada. Um, so just the definition um, of homelessness um, in Canada, the situation of an individual, family, or community without stable, safe, permanent, or appropriate housing, or the immediate prospect or means of acquiring it. So we'll go into a Zoom poll now. Um, which of the following statements of, is true about shelter use in older adults? So if you could uh, select one. So I'll let you sort of read out the, the responses there. They're a little bit lengthy. Okay, so the majority of the group um, was absolutely right that um, even though that there is the rising or the aging population, shelter use in older adults is actually rising um, in our older adults that is out of proportion of our aging population. And we need to keep this in mind when we are, you know, uh, designing and, and um, uh, develop and keep this in mind within shelter use in terms of in shelters in terms of how we are uh, designing them um, and how we're caring for this group. So older adults in shelter system are generally considered older when they're 50 plus and I will sort of speak to this point later in the talk and older adults 50 to 65 and 65 plus are the only age groups where shelter use is increasing and as mentioned this is out of proportion to the aging population and we see a doubling in the 65 plus group um, when they looked at the data from 2005 to 2014. And when we look at our um, older adults, 65 plus, they make up about 4% of shelter use in Canada. And in the 60 plus group in Toronto, they're actually about 10% of uh, shelter users. And the majority of older shelter users in Canada are, are men. This is just sort of the demographic curve. This is in, um, in Toronto, not sort of to um, Canada, but as you see in that 60 plus group, um, about 10% um, uh, being in the age of 60 plus. And this is not specific to older adults, but I think just a very important point to drive home that due to um, systemic racism, uh, lifelong injustices and discrimination, we see that racialized groups are overrepresented within the shelter system. When we look at older adults um, experiencing homelessness, I just wanted to bring this up just to give a little bit of a visual in terms of where are older adults, you know, staying when we say that they're homeless. So we see that older adults 60 and over, actually 10% of those who are staying outdoors um, and about 10% of the group within the city administered uh, shelters. So we've got another poll here. So true or false, older adults um, using shelters have shorter shelter stays than their younger counterparts. So absolutely right. So when we look at those who are using shelters, um, older adults actually have shelter use stays that are twice as long as their younger counterparts. And I think one of the questions in the group um, was sort of, I, I think it was to why um, are older adults experiencing um, homeless at a rate that is um, 
rising in their group and not others. I think this might explain some of that. So um, when we look at pathways to homelessness in older adults, um, we there's sort of two um, two groups. There are those who are have been quote unquote, chronically homeless, um, in which the cycle of homelessness has been maintained. So starting out in their younger years or midlife, and then it's maintained into their senior years. And then there's also new homelessness. And we see um, reasons for this being newly, um, newly being on a fixed income due to retirement, high living costs, lack of affordable housing, health factors, social factors. And in geriatric medicine, new homelessness, um, often multifactorial or a combination of these. Um, and just another way or another schema that I saw sort of described when describing those pathways of late life homelessness in the group who becomes homeless in late life. Um, I, I, this person sort of described absence of safety net. Um, there, they were sort of talking about lack of social insurance or lack of medical insurance. This is from the States. So um, medical insurance, less of, a, of an issue here in Canada. Personal vulnerability. So this may be um, new health care needs, social isolation, limited impact, uh, sorry, limited income, and then our structural factors. So lack of affordable housing, difficult to navigate uh, systems, um, uh, limited supports available. And then from my experience, or at least cases that I've seen at um, Scarborough Village, is that often, so there, there's sort of this um, group of things that makes the person vulnerable to late life homelessness. But what I'm seeing is that there's often a precipitant that underlines or sort of underlies their homelessness when you go back and sort of sift through their chart review. So this may be a new health issue, um, a new uh, the um, development of a geriatric syndrome, which we'll talk about later, a new eviction, um, underlying social circumstances like um, recently losing a spouse or a partner. Um, and then I just want to highlight the, the impact of income um, in our older population. So if we look for reasons for homelessness, this is sort of all comers, not just um, related to older adults. The top reason for homelessness in Toronto in 2018 was migration, and just under that was inability to pay rent or mortgage. And when we think about in Toronto, the average one bedroom apartment being um, $1,700 a month um, and someone being on a fixed seniors income um, of on average about $1,200 a month, you can do the math and see why there um, are a number of seniors who are vulnerable to homelessness. This factored with structural factors, so Toronto community housing, um, just look at the, the wait list for um, acquiring um, uh, low income housing. And then in Toronto, when they surveyed seniors, um, this is in uh, 2017, 27% had difficulty with paying rent, 62% trouble with covering their monthly expenses. And between um, 2011 and 2014, we see a rise in poverty in, in seniors in Toronto. And yes, this is Toronto specific data and our um, cost of living might be very different than other parts of the province, but just really important to sort of drive home that there is that underlying vulnerability due to those structural um, reasons and that personal uh, vulnerability. Um, I'm going to shift gears a bit and talk more about geriatric syndromes in our older adult population. So just another Google poll, um, what proportion of older shelter users report difficulty in managing at least one activity of daily living? Forty percent. So um, everyone's really on on a, a point today. So absolutely right. So about forty percent of um, participants. And remember, I am talking about those who are fifty above. And if um, we were thinking of all comers of those who are uh, not homeless, fifty above, I think that hearing forty percent have difficulty performing with a um, activity of daily living would be a bit surprising. But again, in our older shelter users, fifty plus is sort of when we start to see. Um, uh, especially the chronically um, 
uh, homeless patients is when we start to see the onset of geriatric syndromes. So just uh, um, as mentioned, 40% have difficulty in performing one or more activity of daily living. 33% will have um, reported one plus fall in the last six months. Around 25% are cognitively impaired. 45% have vision impairment. 48% report urinary incontinence. And the prevalence of geriatric syndromes in um, uh, older adults uh, within the shelter system is greater than housed older adults um, that are 20 years older. So we are seeing an increased number of geriatric syndromes at a younger age. Um, and I want to highlight how, um, sort of going back, so this is sort of our, in our chronically um, homeless older adults, but also in our newly homeless older adults, um, geriatric syndromes can be some of the health factors that may precipitate them into new homelessness. And I'd like to take you through a couple of cases that um, illustrate this. So this case, this is a 70-year-old man. He's been at Scarborough Village for three months after being at a downtown shelter for eight months. He's referred for cognition. Um, there's a history of dyslipidemia, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, and hypertension. Um, he was living in a Toronto uh, rental unit, and he goes on a yearly um, trip to Brazil to visit with his son. He returns to Canada, um, and at the airport, he goes straight to the emergency department because he reports having nowhere to go. Um, from the ED, he is sent to a quarantine hotel and then is sent to a shelter. And in the shelter, he is unfortunately assaulted and suffers a subdural hemorrhage and a facial, facial laceration. Um, and he's transferred to Scarborough Village. And when I and, and when I see him, um, I am able to um, eventually be in contact with, uh, with a daughter who he had been reunited with upon um, going to the shelter. Um, and um, they have a strained relationship, so wasn't quite involved in dad's care. But putting together the pieces is that while with the son in Brazil, um, there had been a stroke. After the stroke, he becomes more forgetful, poor planner. He um, is inflexible with poor reasoning. And he is sent back to Canada to get the health care that he needs and lands within the shelter system. And he is in the shelter system for eight months prior to being transferred to Scarborough Village. And when I see him, um, Rudas is 15 out of 30 and he has an abnormal clock draw and now is on the list for long-term care. So really just to highlight, um, cognitive impairment, that's that health issue that is precipitating the new homelessness, personal vulnerability, the patient has uh, social isolation, fixed income, difficulty navigating um, a complex system, and then the structural factors. So um, that complex system that needs to um, navigate being then within the shelter system and being um, uh, labeled as homeless um, that sort of perpetuates this. Um, so that's one, um, the one case. The next case is a 72-year-old retired newspaper ed editor, never married, um, relatively isolated, limited friends. He has one friend that's his power of attorney. At the age of 69, he has a stroke. At the age of 70, the friend um, asked the family doctor to refer to a memory clinic because, again, notices that he's um, inflexible, he's perseverating on money, that his friends owe him, mixing up bills, and is diagnosed with vascular um, dementia. At the age of 71. Um, there is concerns for rotting food um, that he is hoarding. Um, he's deemed incapable for long-term care decision-making. A long-term care application is made and he is on the wait list. And during that time where he is on the wait list, he is evicted from the rental unit that he is at because of the concerns of the conditions of the apartment. Um, he is brought to the emergency department. He goes to the shelter system and has recurrent ED visit visits and admission to the hospital, and then eventually comes to Scarborough Village and is now awaiting long-term care. And I bring up this case, again, we're talking about the cognitive impairment, which probably precipitated um, this person coming into the shelter system. But again, a lot of missed opportunity. This is someone who has a diagnosis of dementia on Connecting Ontario, who has been to the ED and admitted to the hospital while in a shelter, and that has not been questioned. Um, so, so that's sort of our some um, of the geriatric syndromes and how they might precipitate um, new homelessness. And then when we think about our chronically homeless older adults, we see accelerated aging from the homelessness. And I've sort of talked to this a bit earlier throughout the talk. 
And that's why we think that those who are 50 plus um, are considered our geriatric population within the uh, um, for those who are homeless because of chronic stress, barriers to their health promotion and inability to manage health needs, higher rates of substance use, among other reasons. And in this group, we see that they have three to four times higher mortality rate than the general population, um, likely related to unmet physical health needs, mental health needs, and substance use treatment needs. And when we actually look at the reasons for why in the older homeless um, uh, uh, group, um, why they have a higher mortality rate, they actually are suffering higher mortality from cardiovascular disease and cancer. When you look at um, why the mortality rate is higher in younger individuals who are homeless, it's more related to infectious diseases and, and substance use. But we're seeing likely preventable um, uh, illnesses in it, um, like the corn, um, the cardiovascular deaths and cancer deaths, because of those unmet um, physical health needs throughout their life in the shelter system. Um, homeless older adults, 50 to 62, have similar health care needs and comorbidities than those who are 10 to 20 years older. And I just want to highlight um, the accelerated aging that scene um, with another case. So a 61-year-old man, he's an elect. A uh, previous electrician has spent much of his adult life either within rooming houses or various shelters. There's a past history of alcohol use disorder, a stroke in 2016, COPD, he had a hip fracture in 2019, hypertension, dyslipidemia, many emergency department visits for COPD and falls, admitted to Scarborough Village around one year ago, noted to be forgetful, um, having recurrent falls, functional urinary incontinence. And now that he's at Scarborough Village, there's been a reduction of emergency department visits um, for the COPD. Um, and there has, it, there's been the availability for PSW support to, you know, help him with bathing. He's been outfitted with a gate aid, et cetera. When I see him, there's certainly cognitive impairment that's not been previously diagnosed. He scores 14 out of 30 on his root ass, and he has a frontal gait pattern and is very, very um, unsteady when ambulating. So we see, I'm um, in a 61 year old man, somebody with um, um, pretty advanced cognitive impairment recurrent falls, um, bone health um, that has not been um, optimized and seeing um, fracture at a younger age than we would um, typically see, urinary incontinence, and then multimorbidity. Um, I'll switch gears um, and um, talk a little bit about healthcare usage and outcomes in those who are homeless. And we've talked a little bit about this um, already. And I think this is not unexpected to hear that in um, those who are homeless have higher healthcare usage, longer hospital inpatient stays, increased emergency department visits, higher total hospital costs four times increased odds of being readmitted to hospital. And we've touched upon the higher rates of comorbidities and the higher rates of all-cause all mortality in this group. And when you think about, obviously, we talked about a lot of the unmet um, physical health needs, mental health needs, et cetera, that might be driving a lot of this. But then also when sort of from my experiences and going through the literature, we can probably extrapolate that some of this is also due to um, the um, challenge of managing geriatric syndromes within the shelter system. So we know that managing geriatric syndromes in the best of conditions is challenging. And then um, imagine being in the shelter system or outdoors where, um, you know, the environment might not be accessible, might not be modifiable. Um, you might have to vacate during the day. There might not be a place to keep your gate aid if you're even in a building that can accommodate the gate aid. Um, vulnerable to theft, difficulty accessing um, food, um, accessing medications. Um, if you are being sent appointment reminders and you are going from shelter to shelter, how would you be able to keep on top of those reminders if you were even cognitively um, intact? So you can see how that environment mismatch for the older group who is within the shelter system, um, how this might perpetuate a lot of those um, health outcomes that we're seeing or poor health outcomes. 
So the last part of my talk is sort of the, the hardest part for me to come across because I'm not an expert. I don't have great solutions. I have what I have seen in the last year, but I think um, it's going to need a lot of people coming together to try to um, find the best strategies for caring for this group. What I have been able to at least identify is, you know, a lot is going to start at prevention, identifying those who are at risk, you know, being worried about the person who is starting to develop cognitively impairment, but who is very socially frail and has very little social capital. Um, also those with functional impairments, other barriers to them managing independently. And then also um, those who have substance use that might be impeding their um, ability to live independently as well. Um, ensuring that supportive plans are in place. So um, when you do identify someone at risk, when they're in hospital, thinking about how can we improve that transition of care for that individual? How can we help them navigate the system um, more readily? Um, is there an opportunity for intensive case management? And I say that knowing that a lot of the intensive case management programs have their own wait lists. Um, uh, that are quite long and, you know, um, is there an opportunity for more collaborative care in supporting um, this individual? Um, in caring for those who are homeless, you know, um, understanding that their physical illness, mental illness and addictions are all interrelated and you need a comprehensive approach to be able to um, address any of the um, above recognizing and treating geriatric needs. So there is a lot of unidentified cognitive impairment and recognizing it might allow the shelter system to, you know, have the person on um, higher alert for being prompted for medications or um, identifying, you know, at Scarborough Village, um, as I mentioned, it's a very secure, supportive place. There are a couple of individuals who, um, with their cognitive impairment, there is a concern that they may wander. So um, getting them um, wander alert registries, um, they've actually outfitted lanyards that have their name, address, phone number to call, um, et cetera, for those um, individuals. <clears throat> and another strategy that we were talking about was pictures of um, those who are at maybe higher risk of wandering to put at the front desk so that if there is um, a worker who's not um, typically at the shelter who's at the front desk could identify when that person leaves to go and sit on the bench outside that they're maybe keeping a closer um, eye on them. Um, a lot of falls where there's opportunity to either, um, you know, adapt with a gate aid um, or optimize their bone health. Um, a number of nutritional um, or swallowing issues. Um, again, within the shelter system, this can be quite difficult to um, identify and manage due to the fixed diets that are provided. Um, very spoiled at Scarborough Village, again, um, as mentioned. Um, uh, foot care, um, foot wounds, um, again, spoiled at Scarborough Village where there are um, nurses um, who will do uh, dressing changes and a lot of opportunity for looking at the appropriateness um, of medications. Um, again, a lot of um, those who are within the, the shelter system may be going from shelter to shelter. They may have um, uh, no steady primary care. So their medication list may just be a whole bunch of accumulation from previous hospital stays. Um, and there might be a whole bunch of medications that they should be on um, for their underlying physical illnesses. So common things um, that I might be seeing are those past strokes and not being on appropriate stroke preventive therapy, those with previous fractures, um, or those at sort of high risk of fractures being on um, appropriate uh, bone health therapy, those who are um, uh, consuming alcohol being on thiamine. Um, so a lot of opportunity to treat um, appropriate medications within, within the group. Um, again, looking for that environmental mismatch. Um, if someone um, comes across your care and you, you know, identify that there's a geriatric syndrome or something that, you know, the shelter cannot provide, advocating for services or a transfer of, an, uh, of environment, um, recognizing that engagement um, of um, some patients may be limited, especially in those who have been within the shelter system for a longer time. Um, you know, a lot, uh, there's a lot of mistrust for very good reasons, and there might be the need to build rapport over a number of visits. Um, 
seeing people where they are. So that's what I really love about the clinic that I go to. Um, I think I have a lot less no no shows to the clinic because I am going out to that shelter to meet those individuals and they're also within um, a comfortable surrounding. Um, I, I also have to sort of comment that going out to the shelter, I've actually seen a number of um, uh, uh, clients who had actually been referred for geriatric follow-up and that just never happened. Um, but um, a lot less of that no-show by going there. Again, as with any older adult, um, it takes a team um, for those who are at risk of becoming homeless, um, working with um, the case manager who's involved in the community, um, flagging that person um, to the LIN or working with the LIN, um, being flexible. I've learned this um, quite a bit at the on my clinic. I know that there are some clients, if I have them booked for my clinic, um, they may not come. And I sort of, I, I do my first sort of set my new patients in the morning. And then at 1 p.m., I might schedule in a couple follow-ups. And then there are some that if it's a good day, they will come and just bring the person to me because they're, you know, they're having a good day and they're willing to engage that day. So having some level of um, flexibility is also really important. Um, and I will um, get to this, but advocating for supportive environments and supportive shelters um, um, because even though Scarborough Village has not been studied from what I have seen on doing my the chart reviews is that there is a lot of stabilization that occurs in that supportive environment. Um, advocating for housing, um, supportive housing that allows aging in place, easy to navigate and apply. Um, data from the state suggests that housing and case management can reduce hospitalizations, reduce hospital days, reduce emergency department visits in this group, um, and also has reduced costs in hospital-based um, care. Um, and this is my final slide. So just to, or actually not my final, my final slide before my conclusion. So um, just to sort of a synopsis. So when we're thinking about caring for this group, thinking about preventing homelessness, recognizing and addressing geriatric needs, looking at housing, addressing health and social supports. And on top of that is advocacy and awareness. And all of these are interrelated. Um, so if you take home five key points from my talk today, older adults represent a rising group of shelter users due to structural factors and an aging population. Late life homelessness is often multifactorial, like most things in geriatric medicine, may be precipitated by geriatric syndromes and in some, and actually probably many cases may be prevented. Um, older adults who are homeless um, age faster, have higher rates of multimorbidity, functional dependence, geriatric syndromes, be on high alert. Um, most shelters are not designed to meet the needs of older adults. It's no wonder why their healthcare use in this group is higher. Um, prevention, housing, adequate health and social supports are important. And so is your awareness and advocacy. So with that, um, I do see that there's probably some comments in the chat box. Um, happy for questions. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing now if that's okay. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was that was an excellent talk and the chat box has been quite busy. So thank you to all those of you who have been sharing your reactions and your thoughts. Um, maybe we'll we'll start uh, with with the first question here that I see, which is how can we look at supporting hospitals to assist these patients when they come in contact with the system? Um, if not, hospitals want to discharge them once the treatment is complete. So any, any thoughts on that particular question from Ruth? Uh -huh. um, so as I mentioned, when we come to the strategies, this is like, I am not um, an expert in this. I think um, flagging and just advocating um, for that patient, you know, I am really nervous about this person, even though their medical issues have been identified, um, what can we do to ensure that their transition to the community um, is, is better? And if it means keep 
yeah, I know people don't like keeping people longer in hospital, but if it means keeping them in hospital for an extra day to sort out those issues, then that's probably worth it from when you looked at that health data of someone sort of at risk of um, homelessness. Um, but in terms of what, I, I think the question is sort of what hospitals um, can do. I know St. Michael's, they're, um, I'm not sure, is this for someone who's home? I would need to revamp the question. Is it for someone who is homeless or at risk of being homeless? Maybe, uh, Ruth, did you want to try, you know, clarify that in the chat box, provide a bit more information on that? Uh, so Jill, and she says yes. Yeah. For someone who's so I yeah. know it, uh, like at St. Michael's, um, there are homeless outreach um, uh, workers who work within the hospital. Um, so something like that might also be a model to help with that transition from the um, uh, from the hospital to the community. Okay. Um, lots of, sorry, I'm just keeping my eye on the, on the chat box here. There's another question here from, from Gihain. Thank you. How can we advocate for older adults if you are not a family member and where or to who can we raise these concerns to? And thank you, Gihane, you've raised a lot of important points in the chat box about ageism in the system and uh, the needs of older adults. So I guess it probably depends on the the circumstance or the um, for where or who you might advocate to. So depending on you or your role saying I have identified a geriatric syndrome to, you know, their most responsible physician or to, you know, their the person who might be in charge of that discharge, I am concerned this is, you know, the plan that I propose or this is what support that they might need or this is whom I think that they should, you know, see. I think um, we can all be empowered to, you know, just raise the issue to those who might um, be involved in that, that person's care, regardless of whether we are family or not. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, um, lots of questions coming in. So have you had any dialogue with parole officers in helping place older persons who are being released from a correctional facility? Um, and this is from Sandra who works, in, works on policy in terms of older persons and federal custody. No, I have not, but that um, certainly seems like a huge opportunity to make sure that those um, uh, transitions are not um, leaving um, this group vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And Shelly says, recognizing that there is inadequate housing for older adults experiencing homelessness, is there no opportunity for professionals to work with individuals within the environment they're living, which uh, is on, on the street? So these are Excellent questions, hard questions, but really important ones. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so um, absolutely. So as I mentioned that um, um, I don't have all of the, solution, <laughs> the, the solutions because a lot of this is going to be policy um, higher up and addressing those underlying structural issues. Um, but 100%, I think there's a lot that can be done even within those who have, um, who are within the shelter system. So as I mentioned, you know, trying to be uh, flexible, even though I sort of do the outreach clinic to Scarborough Village. Um, I work with case managers to, um, for a few patients that I follow within my clinic at St. Michael's Hospital, where um, they might Zoom with me knowing that they're not going to get that um, patient to actually come to see me within um, the clinic. Um, uh, linking somebody with a case manager um, who's within the shelter system and whom you suspect that um, they might have a need for somebody to help um, uh, get them to appointments, um, organize um, around sort of their, their medical um, and mental health needs. Um, yeah. Great, great, thank you. Um, and another thing I wanted to chime in and say as well for those of you who are healthcare providers on the line who are working in the in Toronto, caring for older adults, 
Um, we at the RGP have recently just launched a health equity leadership coalition. And the purpose of that really is to, to, to have these conversations more in depth and talk about practical strategies that, that health providers can take in supporting older adults from, from various vulnerable populations, um, including the, those living, experiencing homelessness. So it's hard to, to address all of this in a webinar, but this is just the beginning of, of a you know, more in-depth conversation that, that needs to happen. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that as well. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Alliston, any other, any other comments or, or final remarks that you want to make uh, to the group? And I will do a scan of the chat box once again to see if I've missed anything. Uh, no, I, I, I tried to end a bit early to allow time for discussion. So sorry that I haven't used um, all, all of the time that we no. have together. But um, um, no, I just think that this um, is going to be be an, an increasing thing that we see. And I think just having that um, awareness and the eye for those geriatric syndromes um, in older homeless adults who might be coming into your care, um, and then also keeping your eye on out for those who are being vulnerable. Great. And uh, we've had a couple more questions come in. So uh, any suggestions for Ontario health teams in their planning process? Um, and Caitlin says, our local one has priority populations of both uh, older adults with frailty, as well as uh, those who are homeless or precariously housed. Um, and then Sandra also asks, does Scarborough Village have uh, provide palliative end of life care? So no, Scarborough Village um, does not have um, palliative uh, care, but they will refer to Peach um, as needed for um, palliative support. So the um, like palliative um, uh, care for those who are homeless. Um, and then suggestions for the Ontario health teams in uh, planning, um, you know, there are a number of um, case managers that I've worked with for a, a number of um, individuals in uh, my clinic who I think are at high risk of uh, potentially becoming homeless, or I could see who are slipping between the cracks to help with um, care navigation and involving, um, you know, more resources for case management, I think would be, um, you know, something to, to really think of because, you know, some of the more intensive programs, um, the, the wait is, you know, greater than a year and you need that person now um, to help the individual. Um, so I'd think um, something to help with that, that care navigation um, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis would be really important to, to think about for that group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of lots of comments here. <laughs> I try to keep up. So Nandini says, given that low income is a major contributing factor to experiences of homelessness in older adults, do you have any experience with physicians or al allied healthcare professionals facilitating access to income? So, for example, supports for accessing OAS or uh, disability supports. Yeah, so actually at, at Scarborough Village, a lot of one of the things that a lot of the counselors will work on is actually trying to access or help the person navigate some of their um, finances. So the system can actually be quite difficult for someone to um, navigate, especially if there is that cognitive impairment. So there's a number of individuals whom um, I have uh, seen and who they um, uh actually needed to help them access the, the funds or find where their checks have been going. Um, and within some of the shelters, some people just might not even be um, accessing um, their money that uh, they, um, you know, are, are entitled to. Um, so that's one of the things that they work on at Scarborough Village, a lot of the, the counselors will do. So it's an, it's an important point, especially when you see somebody who is socially vulnerable or, or um, uh, uh, socially frail is to sort of, you know, make sure that they are getting the finances that, that, that they should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I want to thank, um, Guy Hain, you've had, you've put in a lot of comments in the chat about your experience, you know, as a caregiver and, and the challenges, 
Um, so Sangeeta has pointed out to, to anyone else who is on the line who has who is concerned about a family member and, and you are a caregiver, you can call Ontario 211 is a fantastic resource. Another great resource is the Ontario Caregiver Hotline. So I'm going to ask um, one of the RGP staff, would you please paste in the chat the link to the Ontario Caregiver Hotline because that is a fantastic resource if you're looking for, you know, connections, services, ideas on on what uh, what can be done to support your the person you're caring for. And, uh, and you can also contact our office as well. Um, okay, so maybe I'm just scanning here. Alex has put a, a question in the chat. Thank you, Sangeetha, for that link. So Alex says, putting aside waitlists and barriers, what is the appropriate housing for these individuals? Is it long-term care? Is it supportive housing? Is it some other type of housing? So at least, so again, I think it really depends on the individual, right? So a lot of the um, clients that I've seen within um, Scarborough Village, some of them, it actually is most appropriate for them to go to long-term care um, uh, because of, you know, cognitive impairment that, his, you know, is um, quite advanced or for whatever um other reason and in other individuals it might be as you mentioned um supportive housing um you know something that's easy for them to navigate and apply um when they are com coming up with the transitional um housing plans you know often they're working with um the buildings to make sure that it's um you know rent that's geared to their income um affordable um a lot of the um supportive buildings that some of the clients are, are being trans in, transitioned to might have the option for uh, congregate meals or meals uh, being provided. Um, and, you know, working through, well, you know, especially if there's cognitive impairment, um, have we thought about how they're going to, you know, make sure that rent is paid. So um, whether, you know, the person uh, requires PGT or whether, you know, setting up, um, uh, monthly bills um, or checks. So those are all sort of things that are sort of um, uh, worked through when some of the patients, at least at Scarborough Village, are being transitioned um, to housing. But I think, you know, bottom line is that with everything in geriatrics is very individualized to the um, individual. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been informative. And thank you to the group for all of your engagement, comments, thoughts, questions, reactions. Certainly, uh, you know, this is just, just one webinar, but we hope to continue to have these sorts of conversations on the health equity of older adult populations. And we look forward to seeing you at our future events. So keep, keep an eye out for our feedback survey and please check our YouTube channel as well because uh, we've posted links to, we'll have this webinar up shortly as well as our past webinars. And uh, if you have any questions, you wanna get in touch with us, you can email us at info at rgptoronto.ca. So with that, thank you again, uh, Dr. Alliston. Thank you everyone on the line. And we hope you have a fantastic uh, afternoon. Bye.